Earthkeeper are honored to present British author, explorer and researcher, Andrew Collins. As a featured keynote speaker at the Earthkeeper Arklandis four-day, epic event in sacred Arkansas, the Crystal Vortex, in September of 2018. Andrew Collins is a celebrated writer, an international, New York Times best-selling author, an honored avant-garde researcher and explorer of ancient sites, living in the United Kingdom. He is the author of more than a dozen books that challenge the way we perceive the past. His fascinating theory revealed in his book, Gateway to Atlantis, pins down the source of a key part of Plato's Atlantis to the Caribbean island of Cuba and the Bahamian archipelago. Andrew Collins has been featured on the Science Channel, Atlantis television documentary, BBC, CNN, National Geographic TV, The History Channel, The Discovery Channel, Ampersand the TV series, Ancient Aliens. He discusses Atlantis in his recent interview. Enjoy and namaste. It's my pleasure. Well, um, our main source for the Atlantis myth is Plato. Uh, he was a philosopher. He lived or uh, wrote approximately around 350 BC. Uh, he wrote two dialogues, one called the Timaeus, uh, another called the Critias. Um, and what these are, are debates between historical characters from a, a few generations before his own time. And they discuss the matters of the day. Um, in the Timaeus, for instance, the first of the two, they talk about science, astronomy, you know, reality, the universe, things like this. Uh, and eventually they get on to a subject which seems to be of, of interest uh, mutually amongst these debaters, and that's the matter of Atlantis. And essentially what is introduced at this point um, as part of this, this dialogue is the story of how there once existed in what Plato refers to as the Atlantic Sea, uh, which is the section of the ocean river that surrounded the ancient world towards the west. Um, it was called uh, the Atlantic Sea because uh, on the coast of Africa there was a huge mountain called Mount Atlas, uh, which was said to be the likeness of, of the god uh, Atlas holding the, 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 the world on his back. Uh, and this would be the last thing that sailors uh, would see on voyages in, deep into the ocean. So hence that's where the name comes from. Um, and it was said that in ancient times, voyagers could travel from his world, in other words, the Mediterranean world, all the way across to what he refers to as the opposite continent. Um, now, he says that Atlantis was an island that linked this opposite, opposite continent, you know, with the uh, central area of the Atlantic, and that a series of other smaller islands linked Atlantis to this opposite continent. Uh, now, he obviously goes on to describe Atlantis itself, but there's some very important facts that emerge simply from, from what I've said so far. Firstly, is that the opposite continent is quite clearly the Americas, because, you know, if you sail west from, from the African coast or from the Mediterranean, the only place you're going to eventually hit is either the American mainland or, of course, the islands of the, the, the Caribbean and the Bahamas. And so it was this that started to, to make me think that this was the rough area that Plato was telling us that Atlantis existed. But he also tells us that it, that it was destroyed in one night of earthquakes and um, floods because the Atlantean people had become too haughty. They'd become too big for their boats. They'd started to invade um, the, 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 the coast of, the, uh, of Europe, uh, they'd even entered into the, the, the Mediterranean, he tells us, and because of which, Zeus, the mighty sky god, decided that he would destroy the Atlanteans, um, and so he creates this cataclysm to destroy them. Now, what Plato says is that the island of Atlantis then sank, 
that in its place was this was these this, this area of shallow water, these mud shawls, as he refers to them. Um, and he said that these have remained hazardous to voyagers ever since, um, and that, in his words, they are no longer able to reach the opposite continent because of these, these very shallow waters. Again, some very important facts here. These mud shoals are something which a number of contemporary writers to Plato also talk about, uh, but they add a vital piece of evidence as to the location of them, because they say that in the same vicinity are large areas of seaweed. Um, now this seaweed is unquestionably what we know as the Sargasso Sea. Sargasso Sea is a massive area of seaweed that stretches from the mid-Atlantic all the way to the Bahamas. But beneath them there is no shallow water, so clearly that's not where Atlantis is. However, just beyond the, um, the, the seaweed is the start of the Bahamas. And the Bahamas, as anybody will know who has ever been there, the waters are extremely shallow. Um, they are, you know, no more than three feet, four feet in some places. Uh, they go to a maximum depth of, of about 15 before you drop off on ledges uh, down to much deeper channels, obviously, in certain parts of it. But they're notorious for their shallow waters. In fact, they're actually even called shoals. Uh, there are parts of, of the, um, for instance, off Bimini, there, there's Mosul shoals. Uh, and that what this is a reference to, to the shallow nature of the, the sea, the, the, the bottom of the sea uh, beneath the surface. So once again, there are indications that this is where Plato suggests that his so-called Atlantic Island, because that's what he first refers to it as, the Atlantic Island. It's only in the second account of Critias that he's, he actually refers to it by name as Atlantis. Um, now, the other interesting point is this cataclysm. What's this? Well, he gives a date for this cataclysm, which is approximately 9600 BC. Uh, of a long period of uh, catastrophe and um, um, uh, bad events going on in the world um, that had begun actually 1200 years earlier with what appears to have been a comet impact uh, that completely devastated the North American continent um, and also affected the Atlantic itself, almost certainly parts of this comet fell into the, the Atlantic Ocean um, and would have drowned areas of the Bahamas and the Caribbean on a temporary level with super tsunamis of the sort that we, we know today from Southeast Asia, uh, Japan, things like this. Things which, to be honest, scientists um, didn't really properly understand until the 2000s. Um, and so here we have more evidence of a cataclysm that is in the time frame that Plato actually gives for the mm -hmm. destruction of Atlantis. Now, he doesn't give the start date of that cataclysm, but he certainly gives the end date of it, which is 9600 BC, because at that point, um, the ice sheets, which had been temporarily re-advanced due to the, uh, the ash and the debris and all the rest of it that had gone up into the air after this comet impact, um, eventually cleared but not before the whole of the northern hemisphere had been covered with ice again. And this ice rapidly disappears around 9,600 in what could have been even a, a second cosmic event around this time. So again, he seems to be absolutely accurate. But then the next question comes, is, is the rest of his account correct? And, and he talks about this massive uh, Atlantis Island Empire with you know, very advanced cities and channels and vessels and whatever. Is, it, is any of that real? Um, and also, we must ask ourselves, well, where did he get this information from? Well, you know, and I think that's a, a very key question of where did he get this information from? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is put ourselves back in 350 BC. This was, um, what would it be, uh, a thousand... 
um, couple, well, nearly 2,000 years before the discovery of the New World, the Americas, by Christopher Columbus and uh, the various explorers that followed him. Um, and the one thing that we know about these explorers is that, firstly, when they got to the Bahamas and the Caribbean, the indigenous peoples told the early chroniclers about this great cataclysm that had split apart the islands, particularly of the Bahamas, and left behind the hundreds of islands and keys that, that, that we have today. And what they said is that formerly all of these had been one landmass. Now, sure. this information must have come from 7,000 years earlier because the reason why these islands split apart was not specifically because, but because the, the waters rose up at the end of the last ice age after this mini ice age had disappeared all of the so-called ice melt water in other words the, 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 the water that had been held within the ice suddenly disappears sorry not doesn't disappear. I mean it suddenly melts and pours into the rivers the rivers outpour it into the oceans and this very gradually over a period of a few thousand years covers up the low-lying regions of not just the Bahamas and the Caribbean, but obviously uh, other low-lying regions elsewhere in the world as well. So in other words, let's say that the Bahamas and the Caribbean were, were, were assaulted twice by water, firstly with these super tsunamis at the time of the initial impact event, and then much later the waters will come in again, but this time on a more permanent basis caused by the rising of the sea levels. And of course the whole thing begins to get confused even though mm -hmm. what's so interesting is that some of the accounts actually talk about the the waters coming in twice and that, and you know and, and you, you've got to say to yourself why is it that these these people believed that the waters had come in twice and not once and clearly they have this dim almost abstract memory of firstly the the tsunamis and then much later the waters rising because of the end of the last ice age. So, you know, as I say, several thousand years these stories must have been hanging around before they were told to the first Europeans to reach there in the end of the 15th century. But, the, you know, having two water coming in stories makes a lot of sense. I mean, to me, you know, the gradual melting of the ice sheet and the rise of the water over a thousand or two thousand years does not equal catastrophe. It does no, it not doesn't. equal the flood. No. And, no. you know, and so, you know, you're left with this. That doesn't make any sense. You know, mm. but I've heard, you know, you know, I've done some research on like the Carolina Bay impact. And I guess there was another impact in the Oregon, Washington area, you mm. know, and then we have the death of all the megafauna that mm. happened around the same time. And then the refreezing of the woolly mammoths and stuff. You know, so that makes more sense. And I've actually never heard anybody put the timeline out that way. Yeah. Well, um, all of what you've just mentioned there, um, everything from the Carolina Bays, which I go into in huge detail in the book, um, all of the evidence that we have relating to their age and what caused them, because this is a, a, a big controversy, a big debate, which is going on even to this day. Uh, because even when they were first discovered by aerial surveys in the 1920s, that one of the first solutions was that they were caused by meteors. Um, and then a few other people came along and said, well, meteors wouldn't leave this type of, of crater behind. Uh, perhaps it was uh, fragments of a, of a comet. Um, and what's interesting, that this was the first time, really, that this idea became popular, that the the Earth had suffered in recent geological history a massive impact event very recently, I mean comparatively recently, I mean we're only talking here uh, the maximum of about 12, 13,000 years ago, which as I say in geological times is yesterday really. Um, and you're talking about the disappearance of the megafauna, with, I mean for instance, yeah, the mammoths, the, the saber-toothed tigers, giant sloths, um, giant camels, and all sorts of weird animals that, that roamed the continents at this time. 
Again, there's various theories as to what happened to them. I've covered this in, in various of my books. Extinction. Um, I don't necessarily think it, it absolutely caused it 100%, because, I mean, we, we know that mammoths survived, for instance, in some parts of Siberia, possibly as, tell, as late as 3,000 to 4,000 BC. Um, so it didn't absolutely destroy every single one of these creatures, but it didn't help their cause, as it were. Um, and so all of this contributed to this immense, this immense, this great change that took place between around 11,000 BC down to about 9,600 BC. But even then, it wasn't over because then the waters started covering up all the low-lying regions, some of it very, very quickly indeed. Um, I mean, and here we possibly have explanations for the, the flood stories which uh, are found all over the world. Hundreds, if not thousands of flood stories, you know, not, not only from North America, but from Britain, from, um, you know, the, the, the Java, Australia, uh, all the way around the world, we have flood stories. And most of them probably relate to this time frame. And the bigger question that we have to ask is, how did Plato get all of this information? Uh, well, the fact is that there is ample evidence to suggest that there was trans-oceanic voyages taking place before his day. And the main culprits for this were the Phoenicians. They were the people that had all the sea ports in places like Lebanon and Syria and what is today Israel and the Palestinian territories and also the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians were a sister colony of the Phoenicians and their main uh, city port was Carthage, which was on the, 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 the coast of northwest Africa. Uh, the Phoenicians also had outposts in Spain uh, and worked with local Iberian uh, peoples. Um, and, in, and after the Phoenicians began to wane in their power, the Spanish people behind these Phoenician collies rose up and basically took over the same trading routes. Um, and what's so interesting is that it was these same Iberian people that Christopher Columbus employed, or the descendants of them, for his own journeys. And they were telling him what he would find when they actually reached into the deep ocean. And this included this legendary island called Antilia. Uh, which I can show, and I, again, I, I do it in great detail in the book, uh, is derived from the, exactly the same place name as Atlantis itself. Uh, they both were one in the same. And it was said that on this Antilia island uh, were the seven cities, uh, the seven lost cities. Uh, and this became a big thing to try and rediscover these seven lost cities, which were supposedly, you know, lined with gold. Um, and uh, the earliest European explorers tried to find them, uh, you know, in the wake of Columbus. When well, they didn't find them in the Bahamas, they didn't find them in Cuba uh, or Hispaniola. They then went to the mainland and started to search in places like Venezuela, up the Orinoco River. Um, and this turned into, um, you know, the, the, the search for El Dorado. This was the search for El Dorado, um, which, you know, never actually came to anything because it was almost certainly just a myth really i mean of course there are plenty of lost civilizations but this idea of this, this these seven cities paved with gold or with this king who was covered in gold all the time um was something that, that was quite clearly a myth that was born out of stories that were already thousands of years old that had reached spain probably from the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians, who there are power, there's powerful evidence of them reaching the American mainland and the Bahamas. So this is how this information got into the world of Plato, into the Mediterranean world, because these stories were almost certainly carried there by sailors you know, seamen who were coming in from these long voyages and they were probably told to keep absolutely quiet about what islands they were uh, 
you know, uh, reaching uh, because of trade reasons, because the, the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians had very strict trade secrets about their journeys and where they would go. And almost certainly with cultures like um, of Mexico, probably by about a thousand BC, and they were bringing in produce into the Mediterranean world, which was finding its way into various places, including, for instance, the cult of the pharaohs in Egypt, where we find evidence of tobacco uh, and also um, cocaine and things like this within the, the, the mummies of the ancient Egyptians. Now, where did this come from? How could co cocaine, which comes from the coca leaf, which is only found in South America, how could that possibly have reached Egypt? Clearly, there was some kind of trade. Now, exactly what routes were going on here, again, is something that I, I, I look at. It could have come across the Atlantic. There may have been other trading routes across the Pacific. Uh, it may well be that um, some of this produce was coming into places like China and then being shipped over land uh, along the Silk Road into the Middle East and then from there into Egypt. But it's real. It's there. Um, and... I think that we have to accept that Christopher Columbus was the last person <laughs> to discover the Americas, not the first. Well, you know, he didn't discover it. The Native Americans were here first, so... That's correct. You know, <laughs> um, but I think that whole concept of trade, you would think that uh, the things that they, they traded they would try to grow and produce in Europe and not just bring bring the final product to Europe. Absolutely. And, I mean, um, tobacco is one example. Um, tobacco, as a, an actual name, was known even before Columbus's journey. Hmm. Uh, and yet this was also the name that was used for what we now know as tobacco, by the indigenous peoples of the Bahamas. Uh, so how is it that the, the, the peoples of Africa and the peoples of, the, of the, the Bahamas were both using the same name for the same thing? Because there was actually an indigenous form of tobacco in Africa, uh, which is very little known. It's a, diff it's a slightly different species, um, and it's not properly used for uh, smoking it, it, it was it was certainly used as a uh, as a herb um, it was used as a remedy and things like this um, there's no real evidence that it was actually smoked however it's exactly the same plant or certainly the same genus so how is this possible and of course the answer is that there was transoceanic contact between the peoples of West Africa uh, and those of the Palmas and almost certainly the mainland of America, uh, you know, a thousand, two, maybe even two thousand years before the time of Columbus. So this is how this, how this exchange of ideas, and it's very possible that the peoples of Africa were importing in um, tobacco, and they realised that they, they had some themselves, or that they, you know, grew their own version of it, that... The, the, that then created like a different strain that although had the same genus as, as that from America um, you know was now two separate species so that's basically what the the experts in this field believe well and would that explain why we find like the Olmec heads that have very Negroid features because they were part of this transoceanic group that got Perhaps. recorded in our yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you look at the art, both uh, the carved statues um, and the, the reliefs at various of the Olmec centres, you will see a mixture of peoples from all over the world, not just from Africa. You'll see peoples from the Middle East with, with, with long pointed beards. Um, you will see peoples from Fiji, from Southeast Asia. Uh, you'll see peoples from, um, from I would say, from Africa, from Europe. I mean, clearly, the Olmec was a very cosmopolitan civilization uh, and almost certainly was trading 
uh, with peoples all over the world, both across the Atlantic and also across the Pacific, most obviously into China, uh, Japan, places like Vietnam? Well, you know, so if they were having all of this flooding, and I'm just kind of going over here a second, if they were having all this flooding and kind of like an annihilation event in the Americas 10,000 years ago, then who was left here? I mean, you know, when we look at America, when Columbus showed up, we had the Native American culture that populated it. But to me, it seems like there was an older culture that even preceded what we find in the Native American culture. Do you absolutely. agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, probably the earliest peoples coming into the Americas was probably around 50,000 BC. I mean, that's that's what the evidence suggests. I mean, they could easily have been here much earlier. Um, and that this connection between the old world and the new world, if you like, uh, probably continued on right the way through till the end of the last ice age when finally, you know, the ice firstly prevented uh, too much contact across the Beringia land bridge between Siberia and, you know, Alaska. Um, and then finally, when that was drowned by the meltwaters from the last ice age, then that cut off contact. That was probably around 8,500 BC. But from about 50,000 through to that time, there was essentially means of contact. And I don't think it was just across the Bringia Land Bridge. Almost certainly there were peoples coming by boats from places like Java, via Australia, New Zealand, um, and possibly even the, the north coast of uh, Antarctica, I say the north coast of the coast uh, between New, New Zealand and uh, southwest South America. Um, and the uh, peoples were probably coming into South America, moving upwards, whereas obviously the archaeologists have it the other way. The peoples were always moving downwards. Um, and amongst these people were, were those that had created high culture at various other parts of the world. Uh, I mean, for instance, in Java, we have a huge pyramid hill called Gunung Padang, uh, of which there is evidence of activity there possibly even a pyramid structure that goes back to 8,000 BC. And, you know, the archaeologists suggest it could even be earlier. So who were these people and how far did they reach? Well, I mean, I've, I've been to Java, um, and not only do the peoples there closely resemble um, some of the ethnic uh, groups of people in places like um, Vietnam, for instance, um, and, you know, Japan and things like that, plus different aspects of culture. So in other words, there's this communication. But also that you look at a lot of the Javanese people and you could be looking at their, there's the same people in Peru or Bolivia, <laughs> people behind the huge civilizations of Tuanaku, for instance. Um, if you look at the statues, you could be looking at people from Java. Uh, and I think that almost certainly there was uh, transoceanic, transpacific communication and contact between these different peoples at a very early age. But obviously we're going a little bit off track of, of Atlantis itself. Uh, but I think that the, the sum total of all of this um, and, you know, all the subjects we're talking about here are essentially in the book is that what we come down to is one fundamental answer and that is that Plato could have received into his philosophical schools of debate information relating not just to the Bahamas and the Caribbean, but also the fact that they suffered a cataclysm several thousand years earlier. Um, and that, you know, he's, he's trying to raise interest in this subject by putting it in his book. It's, it's, it's in many ways, it's almost an afterthought. Um, it's certainly in the first book, the Timaeus, and I think that that probably generated a lot of interest. So the second book that he talked about, the Critias, is all about Atlantis. And he expands upon this subject immeasurably. And I think in some ways what he's done is he's used the core material that he originally had and has expanded it by almost inventing 
this huge civilization and um, you know with cities that resemble those of his own Greek world and this is one of the problems that we've got is the misconceptions that people now have about Atlantis they expect that if we find it underwater somewhere you'll find Doric columns and beautiful temples that look like something out of, of you know of Carthage or Athens or something like this that's because we're seeing everything through the eyes of Plato most likely we are going to be looking at prehistoric monuments that are very similar to the advanced structures that we find at places like Gebekli Tepe in southeast Turkey um, and possibly as I said in Gunung Padang in um, Java um, and various other early advanced monuments that are coming to light all the way around the world that go back to eight to 9,000 BC. Okay. That's Andrew Collins. His book is Atlantis in the Caribbean. His webpage, andrewcollins.com.